I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Well, Well, Well. Or, Well, Well, Well. Or, Well, Well, Well. The determination of Isaac. The determination of Isaac. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And, of course, then we will go to Genesis. Father, thank you so much for the folks tonight. I just ask that you would just give us, before we plunge into another week, that you would please just give us the Word of God in a great way. Lord, we love you. We need you. We want to speak the truth tonight. We want to... Uh, we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to speak this truth. I pray that we would just not go through some kind of a, uh, an exercise. I ask, Father, that you'd break in on this place. I pray that you would please speak to our hearts, that you would change us, that you would help us, that this word of God would connect to us. And, uh, Father, I pray that you would stir us up and that you would revive us and that you would bring us fresh oil from heaven. Lord, I thank you for some of the things that I hear is going on in people's lives. You are touching hearts. You are touching lives, and I thank you for that. Please continue to work, and let your great word of God work powerfully tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In the Bible, wells of water bore significance, both physically and spiritually, as we're going to see tonight. To the nomad desert dweller uh, in the Middle East, Wells meant, wells of water meant survival. They meant life. Wells and springs of fresh water meant the ability to stay alive and sustain a community of people. Where there was no water, there was no life. Where there was no life, there was no community. But those who called upon the Lord in Scripture in these times, wells held a special spiritual value. Not all of them, but many of them. And we know this because it's obvious because of the things that they they named. They named the wells kind of as landmarks of what what the Lord was doing around them. We see this many times in Scripture. The the names of the well bore the significance of what God was doing. Tonight, I I fear that we're only going to touch on the surface of of this end of Genesis chapter 26. And I just, I want to tell you, it's one of those passages that that you study through and you got to keep on going, but you kind of know that there's a whole lot more there. And uh, I would encourage you in your personal time, maybe just one day this week, that you would spend time at the end of of Genesis 26 and let the Lord speak to you a little bit more. It is the story of tonight of Isaac dwelling in the promised land around the towns of Gerar, the town of Gerar where the Philistines own, just like we were talking about this morning. But he's doing something. He's doing something in a big way. He is diligently digging wells. He is digging lots of wells. And what he is doing and why he's doing it bears significance in our personal lives. Would you stand, please? Genesis chapter 26, beginning in verse number 13. Genesis 26, beginning in verse number 13. Let me just say this. This is on my mind, okay? We're the home folk here tonight. And I want to say this to you because it's exciting to me. So, in the history of our church... I said this morning, you know, there were, there's just been a lot of visitors, and some of you are repeat visitors and you're here tonight. There's just been a lot of visitors over the last couple of months. I don't know if you have learned to know some of them or not, but just a lot of visitors. And I wanted to specifically tell them how that we preach in this church, and so I mentioned we preach through books of the Bible, right? Did you hear that this morning? You know, expository preaching, whatever. That's, that was intentional for them to understand what we're doing. So, okay, I, I'm just going to say this because we just— Praise the Lord. How many books of the Bible do you think that we have been through in a church in these years? Okay. If you count the assistant pastors and the books that they went through, we have been through 27 books of the Bible together. That is, that is, that is, praise the Lord. I mean, you, you have gone through, for those of you who've been through the years, you have gone through 27 books, really seeing what the Lord is saying in those books of the Bible. Not cherry picking, and whatever comes to a, a pastor's mind the next week, he pre- preached on, no, going through the word of God. And I, I think that we're the better for it and from hearing the word of God like that. So Genesis 26, beginning in verse number 13. So the Bible says this, and the man waxed great, Isaac, of course, and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks uh, and possessions of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. We saw that this morning at the end. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them and, and filled them with earth. And, and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. He kicked, uh, the king kicked him out of that area. 
And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar. This, this was somewhere away from there, but still in the outskirts of the town Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dig, digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. That's important. It wasn't just about the water. It was about the names too and what they meant. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. Look up here a moment, please. So there are, there are wells of water that you, drig, you dig straight down. I think they're called artesian wells, where you're, you, you get into a cavity of water, and you can put a bucket down, and you can, you can get that. It's like a lake underneath the ground or, or an area of water. And then there are springing wells. And what this means is that it's the same kind of idea, but they're under pressure. And they push to surface uh, on their own. And sometimes they break through the surface, and they, they create a babbling brook where it just straight up out of the ground. This is what they found. Okay, a springing water. And the herdsmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged, a, and, and they digged another well and, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it a Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it, yell it out, what is it? Rehoboth. Oh, that sounds so familiar, right? And that, by the way, this is not in Delaware. Philistine country is not in Delaware. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and will multiply uh, thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built in an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. And then Abimelech, this is the king, remember, went to him from Gerar, and Ahizeth, one of his friends, and, and Phicol, the, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no harm or hurt, uh, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Look up here. That sounds so jolly, right? Okay, what was it, 10 verses before where he's kicking them out of their country or their area, and now he's coming to them, and he's a little bit humble, and they say, we've only done you good. You know, we've only done nice things to you. We didn't hurt you at all. 30. And he made, them a, he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the a morning and, and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day, that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged. And, and he said unto them, We have found water. And said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the, of the city is Beersheba unto this day. And Esau, now we switch gears to 34 and 35. This is commentary. won't say nothing, anything beyond this about it, but it's his other brother. And, and Esau, his twin, was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. You may be seated. After the encounters of this morning with the Philistines and the blessing that came upon Isaac in a great way and the jealousy that came after that, we see Isaac doing an interesting thing. We see Isaac doing a very, very interesting thing. He is digging wells of water. Look at number one, please. Isaac revived the meaningful work of his father's life. Isaac revived the meaningful work of his father's life. So did you look at verse number 18 where it says that Isaac digged again the wells of water? He began to, uh, to go back and to dig the earth out of those wells of water that Abraham's servants you know, back in the day had digged and that the bad guys had filled in. He revived the meaningful work of his father's life. Isaac becomes so blessed that the Philistines are, are so jealous, and, and the king finally tells him to go from us. And though there may have been hard feelings, you know, some people say, well, the hard feelings came uh, over the fact that he, he, he lied to them. 
Well, I, I kind of doubt it. I think it was envy and jealousy, as the Bible says. Isaac is now being uh, evicted because he is, not because he's done something wrong, but because the Lord is blessing his life. He leaves the immediate area, but is not far away, and he is dwelling where Abraham had sojourned in chapter 21. You may remember that the Philistines in Abraham's day had stolen uh, the, one of the wells or taken over one of the wells that he had dug, but Abraham didn't just move away. He confronted King Abimelech, and he says, your servants have stolen my well, and, and I want it back. You know, they're, they're, they're taking my well. He gave him seven lambs. I don't know if you remember this or not, and uh, he, he gave the well back, or he says, this is the first time I've heard this, the king said, and he gave the well back. Well, we're going to see that that Isaac's a lot different than Abraham is dad. He, he isn't a confronter like that. So he leaves Gerar proper for the outskirts valley of Gerar. And when he does this, he begins redigging the wells that his father had dug. And, and, and remembered when, when Abraham, and maybe when he was, uh, heard about these wells, and he probably wasn't born at the time, but he went back and started redigging. But the Philistines had filled them up, as I said, because of spite and because of jealousy. Now notice the end of verse number 18. It says, he called those, those wells by the names his father had named them. One of those wells was named, we had seen and preached in Genesis, Leher Roy, the well of him who lives and sees me. So that was the one, of, one of the well's names is, so when you go to that well, where are you going? You're going to the well of the, one of the ever-living God who sees you, okay? And he called one of them, Abraham had named in this area by the end of this chapter, Beersheba. It's the well of the oath or the well of seven because he had made an oath there. And evidently there were many other wells also that are not named. And we're not, we don't know what their names are, but, but Isaac went back and didn't only redig the wells, but he he established the names of those wells again that his father had named them. These wells meant something. They're, they were the life work of his father. They had spiritual meaning to the family, they, to, to those who were the chosen of the Lord. They were also a map of God's faithfulness and his blessing and his provision to those people, his family. And though spite had filled them in, Isaac redigged them. He dug them out again. He renamed them the meanings of the legacy of his father's life and, and reminded people of, that the Lord had been with Abraham and that the Lord was faithful. What is the lesson here to us? Him going and redigging these wells that have been filled in by spite. Well, the Lord has worked in our forefathers as well. The Lord has worked in the believers, the Christians that have come before us as well. And they have spent their life for meaningful things, especially spiritual things. And their road before us, like that Hebrew says that we are encamped by a cloud of witnesses, of faithful men and women that have come before us. And, and, and they have sown for the Lord, and they have worked for the Lord. In many cases, the enemy has really filled in the meaning of their life, what they were fighting for, what they were working for, the meaning of how they serve the Lord. That shouldn't be okay for us. It shouldn't be okay that things are progressing in a negative way and that those things done for the Lord in the past are being filled in. And like Isaac, in determination, we need to redig many of those wells. You say, well, what wells are you talking about? I want to give you a couple examples of, of redigging these wells. We could talk about many wells, but I want to talk about, first of all, the well of personal holiness. The scripture is full of passages about purity and about godliness and about living righteously and about guarding our eyes and our ears and our minds and our family. But it seems like somehow that the enemy, the devil and his crowd has filled in those wells of personal holiness in our generation or, or that, that, that personal holiness means anything to Christians anymore. There was a time when Christians separated from the darkness of the lust of the flesh, the eyes and the pride of life. There was, there was a fear, a holy fear among believers, but not only among believers. There was also a godly fear that even permeated unbelievers. And to me, in this generation, that seems like it's all but gone. Even unbelievers used to know that God was holy. They used to know what the word blaspheme meant. They used to know that you can do a whole lot of things out in the world, but you ought not 
for instance, steal from a church. They fear God. Personal holiness. But the times have changed. And now our land and our lifestyle is so Sodom and Gomorrah that we allow darkness into our eyes and our ears and our mind and we cannot even blush at impurity anymore. Media and movies uh, and the permeation of, of things like romance novels and pornography and these kind of things have totally desensitized us to God's clear command, be ye holy, for I am holy. And frankly, folks, we need to redig that well. Churches, believers, instead of just kind of glazing over those personal holiness things, individual daddies and mommies, individual Christians and men of God and women of God, Need to redig the well of personal holiness. I, I brought an interesting book uh, for you tonight. It, it's called Social Abominations. And my mother gave it to me when I surrendered, uh, at some point after I surrendered to, to the ministry to preach the word. This book was published in 1892. She did not give it to me in 1892. It says at the beginning of this book, in my mother's handwriting, Toby Whitmer. These men realized the evils of their day and preached hard on sin. These are still the evils of our day, and much more so. May you be reminded of the importance of preaching against sin as you see them, their dedication and use your calling for his glory. July 9th, 1988. Love, Mom. I don't, I'm not going to read you any of the articles in here. They're written, many of them are written by pastors. Charles Spurgeon writes in here, but many are just social leaders of the day, 1892. I want to just read a couple, I want to just read the articles, the names of the articles, and the table of contents, okay? As I looked through this, I, uh, it was very interesting. So, uh, article number three is social extravagance, the accumulation of fortunes. A $10,000 lace dress for a baby. The pressing wants of our large cities. The hope of the future. Wronging the weak and defenseless. So, article number five is clandestine marriages. Forbidden fruit needs repairs. Divorce. Protestantism needs uh, toning up. Secret marriage. Marriage is a joke. Justifiable rebellion. Okay, this is uh, unadulterated perdition proposed by bad women. Article 6 is pitfalls for our boys. Boyhood's pathway beset by many perils. Every mother must be awakened to her duty and responsibility. Evil companionship. Uh, Loafing about the street corners. Vice spreads like wildfire. Mothers cannot be too careful. Keep your little ones near you. The first impure thought. Tobacco using as a vice. Impure stories and jokes. Teach the child that God knows evil thoughts. There is an article after that. Seven, dangers to our girls. A pure and bright girlhood. Cravings for luxury and ease. Dissipation from novel reading. Interesting. Lack of home training. Girls, there's part of the article, girls marrying for a home. So the evils of a girl going out and marrying just so you can have a house, a home. Motherhood, a precious relation. Fashion slaves is article number eight. A move denouncing the bondage of fashion. Ruinous social Dissipation of fashionable society. Another part of that article is must improve the figure. Um, there is there part of this is about actual clothing and about the seduction or the uh, slavery of fashion. There are others. Um, hypnotism in relation to crime. Nurseries of crime. The evil of lodging houses in New York City. Divorce and domestic warfare. Social purity. Uh, Article number 15 is the dance. 
man alive to influence uh, grave and happiness should be guided by certain firm principles. All selection of amusements should be healthy to the body. Um, Deplorable social conditions, broken promises of marriage, social shams, literature, and vice, the tobacco evil, Christians and the opera, Christians and the theater, the opium habit, 1892, whispers. It's interesting. They, they have a section on gossip. Uh, Christ and fallen women, the bane of the laboring man, a slave of liquor is the slave of man. The liquor habit leads to degradation, disease, and death. Poverty makes drunkards of working men. And it goes on. Modern, modern despair and suicidal manias. And it goes on and on. Women's dress. Uh, positive and negative morality. Discourtesy, discourtesy to women. The book's name is Social Abominations, 1892. There was a time when our forefathers were outspoken about things that were evil and things that were wrong. Now, I know that it can be taken too wrong. To, it can be taken into things like legalism. But now it seems like that we're afraid to speak out about anything that is wrong. We're afraid to speak out and say, this is not good for a believer. This is not disciplining ourselves unto holiness. This is not becoming like the image of Christ. We need to redig that, that well. What other wells can we redig? We need to redig the well of, of intensely seeking after God. We see the patriarchs in these chapters, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, calling on the name of the Lord and building altars and, and passionate about the Lord. We read the biographies of great men and women of the past that, have, that spend determined hours on their knees before the Lord, and God's, but God's people seem to have no discipline or determination or any taste to pray long periods of time anymore. No discipline that way. We read the, testimony, uh, the testimonies of those great revivals, and every one of them began when God's people got a burden for calling out to the Lord and got together and, and prayed long periods of time that they would agree to meet in places during their lunch period. They would leave their works. They would come and cry out on the name of the Lord to bring revival and change in their lives and to save their families. We read of the prayer promises of Scripture. We see so many promises about the power of prayer. We need to redig the well of disciplined prayer among believers. We need to redig the well of personal Bible study. My heart drops so very often as I talk to so many believers that haven't read their Bibles for weeks and weeks. What are we doing, folks? What is our problem? Do we not know that this is the well of life? Have we forgotten the power of the Word of God? The well of life is Scripture to be drink, to drink from and to be satisfied. It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. What are we doing? Is it, is it really so hard to read the Bible for a half hour a day? Is that, is that really going to kill anybody in this room? Can we not find a half an hour? If we're too busy to spend a half an hour reading the Word of God, we are too busy. There is nothing that is more important than hearing from God. We need to redig that well. The well of being on fire to serve the Lord. We don't even use that terminology anymore. American Christians seem too tired and too busy and too bored to pick up the Christian flag to sacrifice their self for the cause of something greater than themselves. We forget that only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. We have believed the devil's lie about everything that is wrong with the church, that is full of hypocrites, and, and the pastor isn't right, and everybody's not right, and, and uh, I can just serve the Lord on my own solo fine. We need to redig the well. We need to remember that Jesus loved the church and gave his life for it. We, know we need to remember that God loved the church and created it as a gift to his son, Jesus. And Jesus is the head of the church. You say you love Jesus, you've got to love the church. Jesus loves his church. We need to redig the well of sacrifice for God's work. I could name many other well-meaning wells, no pun intended, that our forefathers dug that now are filled by the enemy. The fight against abortion, the fight against evolution, the fight... Uh, to protect the sanctity of marriage. Have we given up that well? The well of faithful church attendance, the well of hospitality to other believers, the well of personal evangelism, the well of visiting and calling lax church members. All of these wells are in danger of, of being filled, and it's time to be an Isaac and to redig these wells, as well as many other wells. Well.
There's something else in the verses I want to show you here tonight. Number two, Isaac patiently made peace, though he was reportedly provoked, or repeatedly revoked. revoked. Let me say that again. Isaac patiently made peace, though he's, he was repeatedly provoked. That's a tongue twister. Look at 19 and 20. The Bible says, And Isaac's servant digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdsmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Let's keep reading. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And the, the story con- continues. I only read 19 and 20 and 21, but here's the rest of the story. Isaac's servants found a new spring of water. The herdsmen of the area seized it. Uh, Isaac named the well Esek, which means contention. I'm going to call that, that well contention, because you, you take my, my well. Isaac gave them the well. And he moved on. He digged another well. And they fought over that one. And he named, he, he upped what he was naming it. He named that well uh, Sitna, which means hatred. The second well was called hatred. And he, you see later he even uses the word hate. You're treating me like you hate me. And he gave that to them. From there he moved farther away, a great distance away. And he dug another well. And he called it Rehoboth. And by the way, this is why, this verse is why Rehoboth Beach is named Rehoboth. In the early, uh, right before the 1700s, there was an English sea captain, explorer from Jamestown who was following maps. He found this, this beautiful area that had sand dunes and, and greenery sticking up. And he said, wow, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of room. And he named it after this verse. I will call this place Rehoboth. And that's why it's called Rehoboth. He called it Rehoboth. The, the, ma- the name means enlargement or room because he thought now he was far enough away that they won't provoke me anymore. I'm going to name this well Rehoboth because certainly I'm far enough away. In verse number 25, we see God coming to Isaac and once more blessing him with the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Isaac there, the Bible says in verse 25, he called on the name of the Lord. Listen, when you see that in in the scripture, that is a precious term. That means he, he was worshiping the Lord. He was trusting the Lord. It's our equivalence of believing on the Lord and trusting the Lord. And you see this man of God calling on the name of the Lord and building an altar, showing his faith and commitment to Jehovah. It was as if, as if God, and once more God is repeating the Abrahamic covenant. It's as if, if God is encouraging Isaac after he had been provoked these several times by the herdsmen but did not retaliate. He says, hey, I'm still with you. I am still your God. I am still going to bless you. And of course, then Isaac dug a well there. To add insult to injury, in verse number 26, King Abimelech, who had thrown him out, sees that Isaac is becoming greater and greater and greater, and it's obvious that he realizes what could happen. He had heard maybe of the exploits of his father Abraham and his trained servants. Some of you remember that. And he, he, he fears retaliation, so he, so he goes to him with these two other guys, powerful men, and, and uh and he, he, he begs him to give a peace treaty that they would not retaliate. That's in verses 26 through 31. Verse 32 then records one more time that he digs a well after the peace treaty. It's unclear if verse number 32 is talking about well number four or one, well number five in the passage in addition to all the redug wells. In any case, Isaac names it Sheba, which is the word oath which is what his dad called a well there also years and years and years before because he made this peace treaty. He makes this peace treaty with these, these guys who he says, you know, you hated me and you threw me out. But we see Isaac, he made them a feast. We see Isaac is a different kind of guy than Abraham. We see that he is gracious. We see that he is non-confrontational. Now what are we to make all, from all this? How does it apply to us? You'll remember that, as I said, Abraham was a man of confrontation. He confronted Lot. He had trained servants who were ready to fight, and they did fight, and they slew five kings in their armies. He confronted Sarah at one point. He confronted Abimelech, and there are other people in his history that he confronted. He was a man of confrontation. He hit things head on, and frankly, God blessed that confrontation because there is a time for confrontation. But this passage is about Isaac. We saw all that. And we all cheered when we saw Abraham chasing the kings and slewing them, you know, the, the, whatever that 
fight was called, that battle was called, the destruction of the kings or whatever it was called. He, we cheer, yes, there's time to fight. You know, fight for the things that are right, blah, 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 blah. But this passage is about Isaac. And it's about something completely different. Isaac is just the opposite. Isaac is provoked much more than Abraham was provoked. But Isaac is a peacemaker, though he's greatly provoked. He has inherited the heritage of the trained men from his father. No doubt that was passed down. The Bible says that he, is, he has a store of servants. He has a huge amount of servants. Hundreds and hundreds of servants, men. We know that from earlier passage. Hundreds of, of men that could have fought. He could have destroyed the herdsmen without a doubt. Probably could have destroyed the Philistines. Stole his wells, provoked him, but he did not. He went, in fact, folks, and here's the deal. He went to the furthest degree for peace. He went to the furthest degree to preserve peace. He gave the wells that he had dug to them and moved on. When, when the guy throws him out and he says, you hated me, he, he makes a peace treaty with him and makes him a feast. Beds them all down. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse number 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yes, there is a time to be like Abraham, and we preached the things that were worth fighting for. We must confront, resist, rebuke, and fight sometimes. But many more times, and let me just say this most often, instead of being Abraham, we need to be an Isaac. We need to be an Isaac that allows himself, frankly, to be a doormat. And, so, and I use that phrase on purpose because I've heard people say before, yeah, I'm not going to be anyone's doormat. Sounds great, but... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became a doormat. Read Philippians. He allowed himself to be of no reputation. Isaac here is taken advantage of hugely, but just moves on without fight. He allowed himself to be a doormat to keep the peace and trusting himself rather to Almighty God, who had blessed him up to this point, and he knew he would bless him more. Do you see that when Isaac does this, that even those that hate him come to him to make peace? And that's actually a Bible principle. Let me share this verse with you. Proverbs 16 and verse 7 says this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's not always the case. But sometimes it is. We need to give those provoking us and poking us to the Lord. And let him deal with them like Isaac. And this is... This is the lesson of the wells, of him digging all these wells and moving on. This is the lesson of the passage. This is the second point. Yes, redig the wells, but the second point is patiently, patiently make peace. I know that you don't like that. And I don't like it either. And God's working on me in that area. I'd rather be fighting with Abraham. But you and I need to learn this tonight because this is where we are in God's word. And we need to see this guy moving on. There's actually some commentators that call him a coward and a chicken. (laughs) And they say that he should have fought like Abraham. No, I don't think that's what God is showing us, do you? I think he's showing us to be a peacemaker. We need to learn that sometimes the wells of water that we possess are not worth going to war over. Did you hear that? You gotta understand, this is massive work to dig a well. To do it right, to do what these guys were doing. And it became, when you got it established, it it was like a company almost. I mean, it provided for a whole community. It was valuable, very valuable. That's why they stole it. That's why they wanted it from him. This was something very valuable. But Isaac did not count it so dear that he was willing to take life for it or to cause a big deal over it. He was a very humble man, and he just moved on. Isaac patiently made peace, though he was repeatedly provoked. May God give you and me the wisdom to know when it is time to fight, 
and it's time to make peace. Redigging the wells and making peace. I leave you with these two lessons as you face another week for the glory of God. Would you stand please to your feet?